subject of our study in this hour is the parable of the fig tree. We are discussing the role of Israel in Bible prophecy. And this is a continuation of the study that we did previously, number 11 in the series. But before we study about the fig tree, we do want to ask for the Lord's blessing as we do uh, for every presentation before we open the Lord's word. So let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, uh, thank you so much for your presence here. It's so comforting to know that you are here through the ministry of your Holy Spirit and your angels. We need your help because our wisdom is limited. We know very little, just barely enough to get us to heaven, but you know it all. We ask that your wisdom and your knowledge will be shared with us now as we study this very important subject about the fig tree. We ask, Lord, that you will not only help us understand it, but also to understand it in a way that we can share it with those who are perhaps misguided in their concepts of Bible prophecy. We place ourselves in your hands, thanking you for your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to turn in your Bibles with me to Matthew 24, and we are going to read verses 32 to 35. Matthew 24, verses 32 to 35. This is towards the end of what is known as the Olivet Discourse, which is the sermon that Jesus presented to his disciples about the signs that would precede his second coming. And towards the end of uh, his presentation of the different signs before the second coming, Jesus used this analogy to let us know when we could be sure that the coming of Jesus is imminent, is soon to take place. I read now from Matthew 24, verses 32 to 35. Jesus stated, now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that the summer is near. This is speaking about the fig tree in Israel. So Jesus is saying, you know, when you look at the fig tree and the fig tree becomes tender, the branches become tender and it starts to put forth leaves, you know that the summer is near. In other words, that gives you the sign that the summer is near. And now he draws the comparison in verse 33. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. So the fig tree is a parable or an analogy for those who live near the time of the second coming. And then in verse 34, Jesus continued, Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Now, I want to share with you the view that is held by futurists concerning the fig tree in these verses. Basically, their idea is that the fig tree is a symbol of Israel. And by the way, they are right in saying that the fig tree is a symbol of Israel. But the question is, is the fig tree here a symbol of Israel? You see, folks, in prophecy, in symbolic portions of Scripture, Symbols do not always mean the same thing in every context. For example, if I asked you what leaven represents, what would you say? Everybody says, leaven represents sin. But in the parable of the leaven that Jesus gave, the leaven represents the Holy Spirit that is placed in the church, and as a result, the church grows. So leaven can represent sin in one context, and leaven can represent the Holy Spirit in another context. You have to take into account the context. Likewise with a sword. 
In Ephesians 6, 17, the sword is a symbol of the word of God. The sword of the spirit is the word of God. But in Romans 13 and verse 4, the sword is what the civil power has to keep the civil order. And so when you find the word sword, don't assume that the word sword symbolically means the same thing in every context. The same could be said, for example, of the lion. In the Bible, a lion can represent Jesus, the lion of the tribe of Judah. The lion can represent Satan, who goes forth as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. The lion can represent the kingdom of Babylon in Daniel 7, and it can represent Judah, the son of Jacob, in Genesis 49. So just because the fig tree is mentioned here in Matthew 24 does not necessarily mean that the fig tree here represents Israel, even though in other passages it does clearly represent Israel. So basically the concept that futurists have is that this fig tree represents literal Israel, the nation of Israel, and that the fig tree, so to speak, began to sprout in the year 1948 when the nation of Israel resurrected or was reestablished, when the Jewish nation was established in 1948. Futurists also say in the war of 1967, where Israel won over the Arabs, that's a further sign that Israel is now about to fulfill the plan that God has for her. Soon, they say, it's an indication that the rapture will take place and then God's plan for literal Israel will begin again. The plan that was suspended at the end of week number 69 of the 70 weeks. So basically, they understand the sprouting of the fig tree as a sign that Israel would resurrect in 1948, and that would indicate that the rapture of the church is near. We need to take a close look at this concept. Incidentally, by the way, they say that this is the greatest sign that the rapture is soon to take place, the reestablishment of the nation of Israel in 1948. They say of all signs, this is the greatest sign that the final events of the rapture and the tribulation for the Jews, etc., is soon to take place. Now, the first thing that I want us to notice in responding to this concept is that the vine and the fig tree do represent literal Israel. Go with me to the book of Hosea, chapter 9 and verse 10. Hosea, chapter 9 and verse 10. We're going to see that they are right in one sense, and that is that the fig tree can represent Israel, and the vine or the vineyard can also represent Israel. We're not going to deny that. The question is, does the fig tree in this passage represent literal Israel? So let's read Hosea 9 and verse 10. God is speaking here, and he says, I found Israel like grapes. See, there you have the vineyard. I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first fruits on the fig tree in its first season. So you see here, the grapes or the, the vineyard represents Israel, and the fig tree also represents Israel. And then it continues saying, but they went to Baal Peor and separated them, themselves to that shame, they became an abomination like the thing that they loved. So the fig tree and the vineyard both represent Israel. No doubt about it. But once again, the question is, does the fig tree represent Israel in Matthew chapter 24? Now, we are going to study in the next few minutes three passages that describe Israel as a tree. And we're going to find some very important lessons in these three passages 
that describe Israel as a tree. The first uh, passage that we're going to study does not mention the tree as being a fig tree. However, by looking at the other two passages, we're going to see that that tree was really a fig tree, even though it doesn't mention the fig tree. Let's go to the first passage that mentions Israel like a tree. Matthew chapter 3 and verses 8 through 10. Matthew chapter 3 and verses 8 through 10. This is describing the preaching of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist began his preaching six months before Jesus began his ministry. That's a very important detail. John the Baptist began his preaching six months before Jesus began his public ministry. And let's notice what John the Baptist said to the Pharisees and the scribes that were present there listening to his sermon. And I want you to remember the details of this portion of John the Baptist's sermon. It says there in verse 8, he's speaking to literal Jews, to the leadership of the literal Jews. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. That means bear fruit that flows from repentance. So what is John the Baptist telling them to do? He's telling them to what? To bear fruit that comes from repentance. And then he continues, and do not think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. So he's saying, you must repent. Bear fruits. Don't say or don't brag, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Now, if you read Desire of Ages, page 63, Ellen White explains that, G, that John the Baptist was not pointing at literal stones. You see, the pa parallel passage in Luke tells us that there were Gentile soldiers present there listening to John the Baptist as well, besides the Jews who claimed to be the children or the sons of Abraham. And when John the Baptist said, God is able to raise up children of Abraham from these stones, he was pointing at the Gentiles. Because the Jews considered the Gentiles to be stones because they had a stony heart. The Jews referred to the Gentiles as dogs and as pigs or swine. Very politically incorrect and very unkind, I might say. So what John the Baptist is saying, don't you brag because you claim to be children of Abraham. No, no, no. God can raise up children of Abraham from these Gentiles. So is it possible for Gentiles to be children of Abraham even though they don't have the blood of Abraham? Yes or no? Absolutely. He continues. And even now the axe is laid at the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which does not what? Bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So what is John the Baptist telling the literal Jews that he's speaking to? He's saying, listen, repent and bear fruit. Don't brag because you're literal Jews, children of Abraham. God can raise up children of Abraham from these Gentiles. And if you don't bear fruit... The tree will be what? Cut down and thrown into the fire. At this point, we don't know if the Jewish tree produced fruit or not. But two and a half years later, Jesus told a parable of a fig tree. By this time, mind you, three years have passed since John the Baptist began to preach. Six months John the Baptist preached, and Jesus now tells this parable two and a half years into his ministry. So three years have passed since when John the Baptist began to preach and when Jesus told this parable. The parable is found in Luke chapter 13 and verses 1 through 9. Luke 13 and verses 1 through 9. Three years after John the Baptist began his preaching. 
By the way, how many years did the ministry of Jesus last? Three and a half years. So this is one year before he finishes his ministry. Very important chronological details. Here is the parable. There were present at that season some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And of course they believed that when calamity came, God was doing it because the people were bad. God was punishing them. But Jesus says, in verse 2, And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse, worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, is that a common theme with what John the Baptist said? Yes. But unless you repent, you will all likewise what? Perish, which is the same as cutting down the tree. Verse 4. Or those 18 on whom the tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Once again, you have to repent. And if you don't repent, you will perish. And then Jesus is going to illustrate what he has just said with a parable. In verse 6, we find the beginning of the parable. He also spoke this parable. A certain man, and I'm going to interpret the parable as we go along because parables have symbols. The actors represent something besides themselves. So it says a certain man, that's God the Father, by the way, had a fig tree, Israel, planted his vineyard, the world, and he came seeking fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. And what happened when he came seeking fruit on the fig tree? And on it he found none. So three years have passed for the tree that John the Baptist spoke about. And Jesus comes seeking fruit on the fig tree, and there is no fruit. So now notice what's going to happen. Then he said, by the way, once again, it's the certain man, God the Father, who is speaking here. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, that's Jesus, look, for three years, ah, interesting chronology. John the Baptist preached six months. Jesus was two and a half years into his ministry. That's three years. Then he said to the keeper of the vineyard, look, for these three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. And then he says, cut it down. Is that what John the Baptist said if the tree didn't produce fruit? Yes. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? Oh, but the vine dresser, Jesus, he loves that fig tree. <laughs> so he says in verse 8, But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also. In other words, let the fig tree remain for how long? One more year. How many, how many years still remained in the ministry of Jesus? One year. It's important to have these chronological details. So, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. In other words, I'm going to dedicate special attention to this fig tree the last year. And then in verse 9, he says, And if it bears fruit, well, but if not, after that, you can cut it down. You catching the picture? See, we need to learn to connect passages in the Bible. Not only read individual passages, but see how different passages are linked. You know, these tree passages are all interconnected. Very clearly inter interconnected. 
By the way, when the parable ends, the parable ends in suspense. We don't know whether the tree produced fruit or not at this point in the parable. It's left open. Because there's still another year. And nobody yet knows what the fig tree is going to do, if it's going to produce fruit or not. Are you following me? It's similar to the story of the oldest son in the story of the prodigal son. You know, that, that story also ends in suspense. Because the real prodigal was not the younger son, the prodigal was the older one. <laughs> he was lost at home. The other son was lost away from home, but he came back home. But the older brother, he was lost at home. And when his brother comes back smelling like swine, you know, probably his breath smelled like swine's food because he was competing for, with the pigs for the food. And his father receives him with open arms, covers him with his choice robe and puts the signet ring on him, the sign of his authority. And now the father calls a party. Oh, let's celebrate. My son that was lost has, been, has come back home. A reason to celebrate. And the older son, you know, he sees, he hears music and he sees heads moving in the house and he says, what's going on there? He calls the servant. What's going on there? Oh, you haven't heard? Your brother came home. Oh, you should have smelled him. I'm embellishing the story. Whew. You wouldn't believe the dirty clothes that he had on. And you know what your dad did? He gave him a great big hug, gave him the best robe, gave him the signet ring, and called a party. The older son who represents the scribes and the Pharisees, self-sufficient, the older son says, hmm, if anybody deserved a party, it is me. I stayed home. I served my father. He was a son with a servant's mentality. He served as a slave, not as a son. And so, he doesn't even go into the house. His dad has to come out. And he doesn't refer to his, to his, to his father as father. He says, you. And he doesn't refer to his brother as my brother. He says, this your son. <laughs> wow. Jesus says to him, you know, you I always have with me. There was reason to celebrate the return of your brother. The story ends and you don't know if the father was able to talk any sense into his older son. You don't know how the reaction of the scribes and Pharisees was until the end of Jesus' life. Now we need to go to the third fig tree episode. It's in Matthew 21, verses 17 through 19, and we're going to read two other parallel passages as well. This episode is taking place at the very end of Christ's ministry. This is taking place the last week before his death. Just two or three days before his death. Let's read Matthew 21, 17 through 19. Then he left them and went out of the city to Bethany, and he lodged there. Now in the morning, as he returned to the city, he was hungry. And when you're hungry, you look for something to eat. So Jesus is hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves. Now the fig tree in Israel is very interesting because in Israel, first the fig tree bears the fruit and then the leaves come out announcing that the fig tree has fruit. An unusual order. So if the fig tree had leaves, it would be expected that the fig tree have fruit. And Ellen White has a whole chapter in Christ's Object Lessons where she describes this tree had a beautiful leaf, a beautiful tree. 
just like the Jewish nation, had lots of external beautiful things. But the problem is the fig tree had no fruit, just like the Jewish nation had no fruit. Not the fruit of the Spirit. And so he's hungry. He says to his disciples, let's go over there and see if we can, if we can find fruit on the tree. No fruit. Only leaves. And now Jesus says something drastic to this fig tree. Let no fruit grow on you ever again. What does ever again mean? It means you let 2,000 years pass and then it bears fruit. <laughs> of course not. Ever again means that it's not going to bear fruit ever. It's finished. So he says, let no fruit grow on you ever again. And immediately, the fig tree withered away. It didn't wither away overnight. It immediately, it withered. Now let's read the parallel passage in Mark 11, verses 12 through 14. The parallel passage in Mark 11, verses 12 through 14. Now the next day, when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry. And seen from afar a tree having leaves, he went to it to see if perhaps he would find something on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. Now you say, how do we explain that? The spirit of prophecy explains what that means. In that orchard were many fig trees. But only one fig tree had an abundance of leaves. It was a fig tree out of season. Let me ask you, did God benefit the Jewish nation before he benefited any other nation on earth? He most certainly did. Did God expect fruit from Israel before he expected fruit from everyone else? Absolutely. So in other words, there are many fig trees there. The fig trees that have no leaves, they don't raise any expectations because they represent the Gentiles. But this tree that received special privileges, this tree that had leaves should have had fruit. Israel received great blessings and advantages. They should have borne fruit. And so we find here, continuing our reading, in verse 14, in response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. Now the next day, according to Mark 11, 20 and 21, the following verses, they came by that tree again, where Jesus had said, let, let this tree not produce fruit ever again, and notice what condition the tree was in. Beginning with verse 20. Now in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Not only did it wither, the leaves wither, but it dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. What happens when a tree dries up by the roots? That is it. You don't revive it in 1948. Never again will this fig tree produce fruit. It represents the Jewish nation here. And it dried up by its roots. Are you understanding now the connection between this and the previous two references to the tree? Now we know whether the tree that Jesus spoke about in Luke chapter 13 bore fruit or not. A year passed and the fig tree had no fruit. <laughs> 
Now listen up. What happened? It says, that John the Baptist said the tree will be cut down and thrown into the fire. When was Jerusalem, when was the Jewish theocracy destroyed with fire? In the year 70 A.D. The temple and the city were burnt to the ground. In fulfillment of this declaration by Jesus Christ. Are you understanding me? So does God still have, have a special plan for literal Israel? For the literal nation of Israel? For the Jewish theocracy? No. And we need to understand, folks, that God's plan hasn't changed. Did God give Israel the gospel to preach to the world? Yes. But the plan in the Old Testament for Israel was that Israel would be so prosperous and so blessed that all of the nations would say, wow, this nation, they're, they're healthier, their crops grow bigger, and they have more crops than anyone else. The weather is good. You know, they have so many blessings, like the Queen of Sheba when she came to visit Solomon, that people would say, surely this is a wise nation. What's the secret? And then they would say, we serve the Lord. And they would explain to them the sacrificial system. The Messiah was going to come and prepare the world for the coming of Messiah. That's why God chose Israel. He didn't choose them because they were special, according to Deuteronomy 7, because they were more than any other nation, because they were the least. He chose them to be a center of light that people would come to their light, according to Isaiah 61. But instead of shedding light, they hid their light under a bushel. So when the Jewish theocracy is rejected, God says, now, instead of people coming to the center of light, go and teach all nations. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. So in other words, instead of people coming, now the message goes. Is it the same message? Is God's faithful Israel to proclaim the same message? Is the purpose for the church the same purpose for Israel? So what is Israel? Those who are faithful in discerning the Messiah and proclaiming the Messiah to the world. That's Israel. That's true Israel. It is not a literal Israel separated from Jesus who supposedly were regathered to their land in disobedience in 1948. Why would God disperse them in the year 70 among all nations for disobedience and then regather them in disobedience? Are you following me? Israel is also described as a vineyard. See, we're studying here the false prophetic scenario, folks. We have to deal with huge groups of evangelicals and Pentecostals and charismatics and conservative Christians that believe this false prophetic scenario that we've been talking about. And we need to be informed. We need to know how to present what the Bible says about prophecy. So Israel is compared to a vineyard. Matthew 21, verses 33 to 46. We took a look at this in our last presentation, not next to last presentation, but we need to look at it again because we began by saying that Israel is compared with a fig tree and it's compared with a vineyard. So we've already looked at the fig tree. Now let's look at the vineyard. Do you remember, do you remember how many stages of Israel there were? Four. You're sharp. Either I'm a good teacher or you're good students. <laughs> or maybe a combination of both. What was the first stage? 800 years. From the time that God chose them on Sinai to the Babylonian captivity. The second stage was from the times after the captivity to John the Baptist. The end of week number 69. The third stage, at la and last of all, he sends his son. They will respect my son. They take him and throw him out of the vineyard. But even after they do that, there are still three and a half years to the prophecy of the 70 weeks, which we'll study next. It's our next subject. They still have three and a half years 
to think about this and to still receive the Messiah. Probation is not closed for the Jewish theocracy until the year 34. Four stages. Now let's notice this parable. Here another parable, verse 33. There was a certain landowner, that's God the Father, by the way, I'm going to interpret the, the parable, who planted a vineyard, that's Israel, and set a hedge around it. The hedge or the wall is the law of God. Dug a wine press in it and built a tower. The tower represents the temple. And he leased it to vine dressers. That's the Jewish leaders. And went into a far country. Heaven. Now when vintage time came. Drew near. Uh, is fruit to be expected at vintage time? Could, could the owner of the vineyard expect fruit? See it's all about fruit isn't it? Had Israel produced the fruit of the spirit? No. No. So it says, now when vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the vine dressers. That is, to the Jewish leaders. This is before the Babylonian captivity, the first messengers that are sent, that they might receive its fruit. And the vine dressers took his servants, beat one, killed another, and stoned another. That's what Israel did with the prophets during those 800 years. Again, he sent other servants. Stage number two. More than the first. This is after the captivity. And they did likewise to them. Then, last of all, he sent his son. Who is that? Jesus. This is the last of the 70 weeks. Is that when Jesus was here, the last of the 70 weeks? He was baptized at the beginning of the, 70, uh, of the week number 70. In the middle of the week, he was sacrificed. And Stephen is stoned at the end of the last week. So last of all, he sends his son to them saying, they will respect my son. But when the vine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir, come. Let us kill him and seize his inheritance. That's the death of Christ, isn't it? Verse 39. So they took him and cast him out of the vineyard. Did Jesus die outside Jerusalem? Yes, he did. And killed him. Now Jesus asked them, they still don't know that he's talking about them. So Jesus now says in verse 40, Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine dressers? Ah, they said to him, he will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruits in their seasons. Who are those other vine dressers? The Gentiles. Are you following me? Verse 42. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures? The stone, which is speaking about himself, which the builders rejected, has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. In other words, don't you know that the son that is spoken up in this parable is me? The stone that the builders rejected just like you are rejecting me. And then Jesus explains who the other vine dressers are. In verse 43, Jesus says, Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you. Will the kingdom anymore belong to the literal nation of Israel? No. The kingdom will be taken from you and given to a nation, by the way, the word nation is the word ethne, which in the New Testament is consistently used for the Gentiles. God's people are Laos, L-A-O-S. Ethne is a word that refers to Gentiles, to non-Jews. 
And so when Jesus says, therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation, he's saying, I will give it to the ethne who bear the fruits of it. And then he says, whoever falls on this stone, speaking about himself, will be broken. In other words, you'll be converted if you fall on the stone. But on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. So you better fall on the stone, lest the stone fall on you, is what Jesus is saying. And then in verse 45, it says, Now, when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking of them. And instead of saying, man, this guy makes all the sense in the world, we need to shape up. They were filled with greater rage. And they eventually did what Jesus predicted in his parable. They killed a son. <laughs> oh, blindness. Now we need to go back to the fig tree. Let's go back to Matthew 24. Is the budding of the fig tree in Matthew 24 a sign that when the nation of Israel is regathered to their line in disobedience in 1948, that that is the greatest sign that the rapture is soon to take place? Is that the greatest sign, the only sign? Well, we need to read carefully. Notice Matthew chapter 24, verses 32 and 33. Jesus stated, as you see the fig tree, bud, it is a sign that summer is near. In the same way, now listen carefully, when you see all these things, is Jesus referring only to the budding of the fig tree? As the one sign? No, he says, when you see all of the signs that I've spoken of in Matthew 24, know that it is near even at the doors. So the budding of the fig tree is not the great sign. It is an accumulation of signs that the end is near. Now, it's important for us to also read Luke 21, 29 to 31, where you have the parallel. We always need to look for the parallel passage in the Gospels because the parallel can add details. In Luke 21, 29 to 31, it says, then he spoke to them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. Does he single out only the fig tree? No. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they are already budding, because in springtime they all bred, uh, bud basically at the same time. When they are budding, you see and know for yourselves that summer is ne near. So also when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Are you following me? So in Matthew chapter 24, the fig tree has nothing to do with Israel. Jesus is just using an analogy. He's saying, you know, when you see the trees that are budding, you know that the, that the, that the summer is near. Well, in the same way, when you see all these signs, not the Israel sign, but all these signs, you can know that my coming is near. So it's the fig tree, like in other passages, but in, in this case, it's only used as an analogy that indicates by the signs that Jesus is soon to come. Now there's one more passage that we especially need to look at. John 1, 43 to 48. John 1, verse 43 through verse 48. This is the encounter of Jesus with Nathanael, one of the lesser known disciples, but this passage puts him on the map, so to speak. Let's read beginning in verse 43. The following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee. And he found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, 
we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. They're saying, we have found the Messiah. <laughs> and now Nathaniel says something that, uh, that we've all read before. And Nathaniel said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? <laughs> You're saying the Messiah is from Nazareth. Be real. It's kind of like saying Caracas, Venezuela. <laughs> These days. The most dangerous city in the world. That would be like saying that, that the Messiah is from Nazareth. Continues. Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, now listen carefully, said of him, behold, an Israelite indeed. What does Jesus say about Nathanael? An Israelite indeed. By the way, if there are Israelites indeed, there are also Israelites not indeed. In fact, in the Greek, the word Israelite indeed means a genuine Israelite. Not a counterfeit one, a genuine one. So he says, behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no deceit. And now notice, Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. So the Israelite indeed is sitting under the fig tree. <laughs> In other words, you have the symbol and what the symbol represents. Now the question is, why did Jesus say to Nathanael that he was an Israelite indeed, or a genuine Israelite, a real Israelite? He said that because in verse 39, 49, Nathanael said, you are the Messiah the Son of God. Whom did Nathanael confess? The Messiah. And therefore, he was an Israelite. What kind of Israelite? An Israelite indeed is one who confesses Jesus as Savior and Lord. Are you catching the picture? So let me ask you, the literal Israelites today that reject the Messiah, are they Israel? No. Now, they're physically Israel, okay? They're, they're physically Jews. But the Apostle Paul said that not every Jew is a Jew. And the amazing thing is that, for example, in Galatians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul gives an allegory. It's the allegory of Sarah and Hagar and their respective sons. Isaac is Sarah's son, and Ishmael is the son of Hagar. And if you read Galatians 4, 21 to 31, Jesus, I mean, Paul makes a revolutionary statement. He says that the Jews of his day are sons of Hagar, and the Gentiles are sons of Sarah. What he's saying is, spiritually speaking, the Jews are Arabs and the Arabs are Jews. <laughs> and the reason why is because Sarah and Isaac are the free ones. Jesus said, if you accept the Son, the Son will make you free indeed. And they say, we've never been in bondage to anyone. Let's read that passage in closing. John 8, 
37 to 45, John 8, 37 to 45. We looked at it in our, in our last presentation, but let's take a look at it again in the light of what we're studying now. Jesus is speaking to literal Jews who claim to be children of Abraham. By the way, I hope that you will understand that I have nothing against individual Jews. We can never be anti-Semitic. We love people from every nation in the world. God has no favorites, okay? We need to love individual Jews. What we're talking about is that God no longer uses the Jewish theocracy to fulfill his purpose. It's the Christian church that continues the legacy of Israel of preaching the same gospel that they preached in promise that our Israel. Jesus says, I know that you are Abraham's descendants, literally speaking. But you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father. You do what you have seen with your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Was Abraham their father? Yes and no. Physically, yes. Spiritually, no. They were not spiritual Israel. They were literal Israel. Verse 39. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if... Basically, the implication is that they're not. If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. Do you know Jesus said in John 8, verse 56, Abraham saw my, do my day and rejoiced. And he was referring to the, to the sacrifice of Isaac, who was not actually sacrificed. That experience in Genesis 22. Beautiful figure of the father being willing to give up his only begotten son. Abraham understood that that represented the fact that God the father was going to, going to give his son to deliver the human race. So Jesus said, Abraham saw my day and rejoiced. But the, but the literal Jews of Christ's day, they didn't rejoice. They wanted to kill him. So did their works show that they were not children of Abraham? Yes, because they did not have the spirit of Abraham. So Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. Abraham didn't want to kill me. He recognized I was the coming seed that was going to bless every nation on earth. And then in verse 41, Jesus says, you do the deeds of your father. They said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father God. In other words, they're, they're saying, you know, you were born of fornication. We don't know who your father is. Our father is God, they say. Hmm. Jesus said to them, if, once again, the implication is that they're not. If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. And then he says these terrible words. You are of your father, the devil. And the desires of your father you want to do. Who wanted to slay Christ? Satan. Right? The murderous spirit that they had was the murderous spirit of their father. So he says, you are of your father the devil. And the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. For he is a liar and the father of it. Interesting, Nathaniel, it says that in his mouth there was no deceit. 
And here it says that true Israelites tell the truth. Incidentally, this has huge implications for the interpretation of the book of Revelation. Because in the book of Revelation, we have 144,000. By the way, I believe the numbers is symbolic because numbers in prophecy are symbolic. And we're not dealing with literal Israelites. We are dealing with spiritual Israelites. They have the seal of God on their forehead. They can't be just physical Israelites without Christ. And the interesting thing is that one of the characteristics of 144,000, it says that in their mouth was found no deceit. They are faithful Israel that will remain and be alive when Jesus comes. Those are the ones that are alive and remain, will be caught up in the clouds with those who resurrect from the grave to then travel to heaven and be eternally there with Jesus Christ. And I repeat this, in 1948, the Jewish nation was still rejecting the Messiah. And therefore, 1948 could not be a fulfillment of prophecy because God scattered Israel because they rejected the Messiah. We're going to see that when we study the 70 weeks. Jesus said, because you did not know the time of your visitation, the city is going to be destroyed. So the question is, would God scatter literal Israel for rejecting the Messiah and then regather them in 1948 when they are still rejecting the Messiah? All of the promises of God are conditional. God never makes an absolute promise without there being a condition of response from us. When he makes promises to human beings, it's conditioned on us meeting the conditions. And that's the reason why when God established the covenant with Israel on Mount Sinai, he said, if you will obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you will be my special people above all nations of the world. So in short, 1948 is meaningless in the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. And I'll tell you, I think that Satan, in fact, I know Satan was the one behind the Holocaust. And because of the Holocaust, the nations of the world were so disgusted that that led them to lobby for the establishment of the nation of Israel. In our next study, we will pick up on this particular point.